Welcome back. Chapter 3. What do you want, David? Warden Phillips McKenzie does not appear pleased by my visit. His office is institutionally sparse. There is an American flag on a pole in one corner along with a photograph of the current governor. His desk is gray and metal and functional and reminds me of the ones my teachers had when I was in elementary school. A brass pen pencil clock set you'd find in the gift area at TJ Mack sits off to the right. Two tall matching gray metal file cabinets stand behind him like watchtowers. Well, <clears throat> I have rehearsed what I would say, but I don't stick to the script. I try to keep my voice even, flat, monotone, professional even. My words would, I know, sound crazy, so I need my tone to, to do the opposite. To his credit, the warden sits back and listens, and for a little while he does not look too stunned. When I finish speaking, he leans back and looks off. He takes a few breaths. Philip McKenzie is north of 70 years old, but he still looks powerful enough to raise one of those still reinforced concrete walls that surround this place. His chest is burly, his bald head jammed between two bowling ball shoulders with no apparent need for a neck. <laughs> That's not <laughs> His hands are huge and gnawed. They sit on his desk now like two battered rams. He finally turns towards me with weathered blue eyes capped by bushy white eyebrows. You can't be serious, he says. I sit up straight. It's Matthew. He dismisses my word with a wave of a giant hand. Ah, oh, come off it, David. What are you trying to pull here? I just stare at him. You're looking for a way out. Every inmate is. You think this is some ploy to get released? I struggle to keep my voice from breaking. You think I give a rat's ass if I ever get out of this hellhole? Philip McKenzie signs and shakes his head. Philip, I say. My son is out there somewhere. Your son is dead. No, you killed him. No, I can show you the photograph. The one your sister-in-law brought you? Yes. Okay, sure. I'm supposed to know that some boy in the background is your son, Matthew, who died when he was, what, three? I say nothing. And let's say I don't know that I did. I can't. I mean, it's impossible, even if you admit that. But let's say it's somehow the spinning image of Matthew. You said Rachel checked it with age progressing technology, right? Right. So how do you know she didn't just Photoshop his age progressive face into the picture? What? Do you know how easy it is to doctor photographs? You're kidding, right? I frown. Why would she do that? Exactly. Why would she do that? Philip McKenzie stopped. Wait, of course. What? You don't know what happened to Rachel. What are you talking about? Her career as a journalist is over. I said nothing. That's why Rachel didn't answer his question, what happened? Uh-oh, we got to find out. You don't know that, did you? I mean, you didn't know that, did you? It doesn't matter, I say, but of course it does. I lean forward and pin the man I've known my whole life as Uncle Philip with my, with my eyes. I've been here for five years now, I say in my most measured tone. How many times have I come to you for help? Zero, he says. But that doesn't mean I haven't given it to you. You think it's a coincidence that you ended up in my prison? or that you got so much extra time in the isolation wing. They wanted you back in regular population, even after that beating. It was three weeks after the start of my incarceration. I was in general pop, not here in the isolation wing. Four men whose bulk was only outsized by their depravity cornered me in the shower. The shower. 
oldest trick in the book. No rape, nothing sexual. They just wanted to beat the hell out of someone and to feel some sort of primitive, primitive high. And who better than prison news celebrity baby killer? They broke my nose. They shattered my cheekbone. My cracked jaw, my cracked jaw flapped like a door missing a hinge. Four broken ribs, a concussion, internal bleeding. My eye, my right eye only sees fuzzy images now. I spent two months in the infirmary. I pulled the ace out of my deck. You owe me, Philip. Correction, I owe your father. Same thing now. You think his marker passed down to his son? What would dad say? Philip looks pained and suddenly weary. I didn't kill Matthew, I said. An inmate telling me he's innocent. He says with an almost amused shake of his head, this has, ha this has to be a first. Philip rises from his chair and turns towards the window. He looks out into the woods past the fence. When your father first heard about Matthew, and even worse, when he found out you were arrested, his voice trails off. Tell me, David, why didn't you plead temporary insanity? You think I was interested in finding a legal loophole? It wasn't a loophole, Philip says, and I hear sympathy in his tone now. He turns back to me. You blacked out. Something inside of you snapped. There had to be an explanation. We would have all stuck by you. My, my head begins to throb. Another product of that beating, or perhaps his words are the cause. I close my eyes and draw a deep breath. Please listen to me. It wasn't Matthew. And whatever happened, I didn't do it. So, you were set up, huh? I don't know. So, whose body did you find? I don't know. How do you explain your fingerprints on the weapon? It was my bat. I kept it in, my, in the garage. And what about the old lady who saw you burying it? I don't know. I only know what I saw in the photograph. The older, man's, the older man sighs again. Do you realize how delusional you sound? I stand now too. To my surprise, Philip takes a step back as though he's afraid of me. You have to get me out of here, I whisper, for a few days anyway. Are you out of your mind? Get me a bereavement leave or something. We don't offer those to your class of felon. You know that. Then find a way to help me break out. He laughs at that. Oh, sure, no problem. And let's say hypothetically, I could do that. They'll come after you with everything they got, brutally. You're a baby killer, David. They'll gun you down without a second thought. Not your problem. Like hell it's not. Suppose this happened to you, I say. What? Suppose you were in my place. Suppose you murdered a boy, your boy Adam, what would you do to find him? I'm going to read that again because I don't think I read that right. Suppose you were in my place. Suppose the murdered boy was Adam. What would you do to find him? Philip shakes his head and collapses back into his chair. He puts both hands on his face and rub vigorously. Then he hits the intercom and calls for a guard. Goodbye, David. Please, Philip. I'm sorry. I really am. Mm -hmm. Philip diverted his gaze so he wouldn't see his correctional officer enter and escort David out. He didn't say goodbye to his godson. After he left, Philip sat in his office alone. The air felt heavy around him. He had hoped that David's request to see him, the first one David had made in nearly five years he'd been incarcerated here, would be some sort of positive sign. Perhaps David finally wanted to get help from a, from a mental health professional. Perhaps David wanted to take a deeper dive into what he'd done that awful night, or at the very least, 
try to scratch out some kind of productive life, even here, even after what he'd done. Philip opened his desk drawer and took out a photograph from 1973 of two men. Correction, dumb kids, decked out in military fatigue in Khan Sand. Philip Mackenzie and Lenny Burroughs, David's father. They've both gone to Re Revere High School before being drafted. Philip grew up on the top floor of the three family row house in Centennial, on Centennial Avenue. Lenny lived a block away on Dehan Street. Best friends, war buddies, cops patrolling Revere Beach. Philip has stood as David's godfather. Lenny had been Philip's son's, what? Lenny had been Philip's son's Adams. Adam and David had gone to school together. The two had been best friends at Revere High School. The cycle had started anew. Philip stared at the image of his old friend. Lenny was lying on his deathbed now. There was nothing anyone could do to help him. It was just a matter of time. The Lenny in the old photo was smiling that Lenny smile, the one that made hearts melt, but his eyes seemed to bore right now into Philip's. Nothing I can do, Lenny, he said out loud. The photo Lenny just smiled and stared. Philip took a few deep breaths. It was getting late. His office would be closing soon. He reached out and hit the intercom button on his desk again. His receptionist, his receptionist says, yes, warden? Get me on the first flight to Boston in the morning. And that's the end of chapter three. So the warden is David's godfather. And he's he feel kind of obligated to David's father, Larry. So is he going to help David get out and try to solve this? Could he? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know the laws, but I wonder if he could. And let's see, what else did I have to say? Let me think. Let me think. We still don't know what happened to Rachel. Is this going to be a part where they're going to be dragging it on in the story for us to find out later that it was a hoax? We'll find out. Let me not jump the gun too soon. But Rachel must have did something. And it and um what's his name? The warding. Philip hinted that she might be doing this to get her career back. So if she, this is the case, she was acting dumb when David brought it up last chapter. Hmm. We shall find out. There was no word, so we shall see you. I shall see you in chapter one. Bye.